like pre present now. Well, yeah, come, come okay. sit up. You can sit. You can be right here. Okay. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I'm just gonna gonna introduce you. All right. Well, <clears throat> here, there's Ethan there. Welcome everybody to um, to the Schaffler Scholar Series. This series was started in 2015 to provide the NMH community with an opportunity to learn about the scholarly and artistic pursuits of our faculty beyond their work here at NMH. Tonight, for the very first time, the scholars of the Schaffler series are students. So this is really exciting. Two students will present on their independent study projects. Mona Zhang will discuss her work developing a Java program that assigns class schedules to NMH students. And Ethan Ho will present on using 3D printing technology to enhance stem cell regeneration. So I'd like to start by welcoming Mona. Uh, she loves anything related to math. Recently, she was featured in the NMH magazine for her independent study work with her advisor, Abby Ross. Uh, as a part of the Rhodes Fellowship course in social entrepreneurship, she started Math Storytime, which you, you did here and then you did other in, in another local town, an organization that works to better reflect math's applicability in the real world by incorporating word problems into classic children's books. In her free time, she tries to bake uh, with the guidance from her younger sister and plays long games of Monopoly. So welcome, Mona. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So when you go up here, go to library open classroom. And okay. Good. Okay. There you go. Excellent. All right. Okay. Hello. Okay. <laughs> um, I. I'm going to talk about my, um, my journey through this whole um, process and this project that I've been doing, um, which I started last semester, two semesters ago, um, last spring, um, during one of my independent studies, um, where I tried to develop a computer program that could do two major things. So first, assign a preliminary class schedule to NMH students. Um, just the schedule, um, and then to hopefully optimize the schedule so that it optimizes the collective happiness of students at NMH by getting them class that they want, <laughs> like a schedule should. <laughs> um, Jay so, Lord must love you. <laughs> 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 um, but before I ha like started actually coding this project and working through the kinks, um, I had to uh, like figure out what the best schedule really meant um, and how I sh would define that um, and that would obviously affect my program that I created. Um, so I was looking for like because you could define like this best schedule to be all sorts of ways like whether it be like for everyone or for a certain group of students or it could, it could be anything. <laughs> um, so um, I personally define this optimum assignment as an assignment that prioritize assigning more first choice classes than versus assigning fewer third choice classes. So when we uh, like register for courses here at NMH, we like put we put down our first and third first to third choice classes um, in a list. And I thought that it'd be more important for us to have more first choice classes versus fewer third choice classes. Um, so that was one of my points. And the second one was um, prioritizing the assignment of required classes as well as like special electives like like select performing arts groups or things like that where like those would probably take priority because they, they're not offered in the other block. Um, so I had a plan. <laughs> um, so my plan was to kind of go about this through like a greedy algorithm approach. Um, so what a greedy algorithm is, is that it optimizes, uh, it makes, so what it does is it makes locally optimal choices um, in the hopes that these choices will lead to a globally optimal solution. Um, so, <laughs> may or may not work, but hopefully it will. Um, it generally should, um, or get pretty close. Um, so this is how, I'm just gonna go through my like assignment process real quickly. Um, so the first thing that I did in my program was I tried to quantify the amount of conflict that any student has in their schedule or in their, in their selected courses. Um, so this is kind of hard because it's kind of hard to quantify conflict because conflict seems like a very subjective thing. Um, 
But what I did was I assigned these values to each student um, called non-conflict values. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about non-conflict values in the, on the next slide. Um, but I'll just start by first telling you why I'm assigning these values. So I basically these values ranked students from students with the most conflict in their schedule, meaning that there weren't a lot of options or there was a lot of flexibility in the way that their schedule could be arranged, um, all the way to students that had a lot of flexibility and a lot of options in how their schedule could be arranged and shifted around. Um, so, that, and then in doing so, we could, uh, I guess, schedule the students in that order so that even though I, I was using a greeting, I was using a greedy algorithm, um, I would still like have a pretty optimal solution relatively. Um, okay, so more on non-conflict values. So I define this non-conflict value um, to be the total number of arrangements for student schedule that do not conflict with each other. So in, I rich okay, so this is funny because I originally wanted to do like a ratio kind of thing where I put that number over the total number of arrangements, including the conflicting ones. Um, but what I found was that um, that didn't work because obviously some students had more possible arrangements and for once if, if there was like one out of one like one out of one you'd seem like that student had a lot of options when they really didn't um, so I just instead I just use the number of arrangements total so if you go here you see that like for these students that I've sorted um, from one to ten these are this is their sorted um, this is their sorted non they're, they're sorted by the by their non-conflict values so these students have um, very few non-conflict, so a lot of conflict, and these students have a lot of non-conflict, so not very much conflict. Um, and also, another key point that I just want to emphasize is that for students that had, um, you don't you don't see this in the previous example that I just showed you, um, but for students that have a non-conflict number of zero, I would assign them last, um, because would that mean if they got a non-conflict value of zero, mean that that no, none of their like their courses could possibly arra be arranged in a way that would um, get them all their first choice classes. So it made sense for them to, ki to, to be sorted after everyone else got their priority, priority classes first. Um, so yeah, this is an example of like how, how my output looked like after I ran the program. <coughs> um, and then, so I talked a little bit this before, but after uh, assigning these non-conflict values, I would assign classes in, to students in the order of that those non-conflict values, um, and so the point of that was that so that like if classes got full, um, students with a lot of different options um, would go last and would like wouldn't they wouldn't, it wouldn't bother them as much as students that had only a few select um, possibilities for arranging their schedule. Um, another thing that I did, um, which was added a little later in the process, was this thing called flagging. Um, so I could flag a situation or flag a student. Um, and what flagging meant was that someone, like a person, like a human being, or Jay Ward, <laughs> would come over and look, look uh, kind of assess the situation and then make edits um, based on his own discretion. Um, so kind of like a, something that needed like a human element to it. Um, so certain situations would be flagged. So for example, if a student wanted to get, like the only way for a student to get like the first choice class was, was for them to be in a course that was already full, um, that, would, that situation would be flagged. And then, for example, Jay Ward could come over here and be like, well, this student could have another schedule, but we'll put you in here and take another student out. So there's a couple ways around that. Um, or, for example, if we could deal with another student in that class, like we have enough room for that. So there, it would just involve a lot of human discretion. Um, this would also happen if something like a student couldn't take required classes for some reason or something like that happened, um, the student would also be flagged. Um, so in action, we can see that um, this isn't very pretty, but we can see that these are the students beforehand. Um, so this is student zero all the way to student two right here. Um, and their courses, like their schedule would come out to be this while their courses would be here. So like it would just, this is like my output of my code. Um, let's see. Um, and then I just want to talk a little bit about like things I want to do next um, with my program. Um, so I think one of the things I've been thinking that Abby and I were talking about was like that'd be kind of a crazy idea um, would be to put all students in all the classes that they selected, so the first, second, and third choice classes, and then remove the less ideal options. Um, so could be hard, maybe a little bit hard to do, um, but it could be really interesting. And I wonder how that output would compare to the one that I have right now. Um, 
And then the other thing is that we were talking about is I did a little bit of graph theory in that independent study, so we were thinking about like using like a graph coloring approach um, to this problem. Um, and I had also had a few takeaways. Um, so I kind of figured out that an idea that comes really simply to me like in my head may not necessarily be easy to write into a program. Um, so it may, may not be easy for a computer to do or may not be easy for me to tell a computer to do. Um, it doesn't really work like that. <laughs> um, so I found, I found this, I find this to also be true in things like number theory, um, where sometimes we have like a, something that we're supposed to prove that seems so intuitive and just so obvious, um, but just there's no way for me to put it in words. It just seems like you should, everyone should get this. Like why do I have to prove this? <laughs> um, but things are just so like simple to me, but not simple to write into a program. Um, and then I also realized that I might not like ever finish this program, and I don't know if I expected to, <laughs> but I feel like I, this program has like, I've just been making tweaks for the last almost year, um, so <laughs> it's just been following me all around. Um, over the summer, I rewrote the program from Python to Java, so that was a pretty big step, but um, between now and then, I've also made small tweaks and adding things here and there. Um, <laughs> so yeah, thank you. <laughs> In, in listening to your comment that you were thinking about what would happen if you assign all the kids their first choices, is it possible to assign all the kids the first choices and make the courses shuffle as opposed to mm -hmm. shuffling the kids and leaving the courses the same? Right. Um, so when I was starting off this process, I was thinking, I was also thinking about like developing an optimal schedule for the courses. Um, but I. I kind of paused at that because I didn't know how useful a tool like that could be to NMH, um, especially because, like, I think that would definitely be possible. But like, I think at, at least at a place like NMH, we have we've had courses here for a while, and like our schedules have worked out pretty well in as in general. Um, so I wanted to look more from a student perspective. Um, especially because I like I've always I found that I've had a lot of problems with like scheduling courses, which ironically is why I did this independent study. Um, so I think I like that was where I really came from when I was talking. It's like I really want to see it, see this problem from a student perspective. Um, but yeah, that's definitely a, an option. Yeah. So you mentioned um, using uh, like in your next step, you might. Uh, place all students in all classes and then eliminating yep. the classes, the uh, least um, best option, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, what are like the foreseeable benefits for doing that? Right, so one of the things that I had trouble with was the whole idea of me using a greedy algorithm. Because by using a greedy algorithm, I wasn't, like for example, if we started with these students and they filled up certain classes, but the students after them needed those classes to get their first choices, then I would be left with an unoptimal situation. Um, that was very possible. So, so the whole idea about of like, of the whole like non-conflict thing was to in order so that that would happen less often. Um, so by putting everyone into all these cl all their selected classes, um, I guess the idea would be that I would have like there wouldn't be any prioritizing. So no student would be put in before any other student. Um, courses could be taken out, I guess, and. And or but I, I this is kind of like a gut feeling. I feel like it might be easier to take out courses, and uh, keep students in. Like the, you know what I mean. Like I don't know how to explain this. But I feel like it'd be easier to take out courses, leaving students in the right courses, than to put them in the right courses in the first try. Um, I think it could be easier to look at it that way. Yeah. Where did you get the sort of data about student preferences yeah. and what courses is it? Yeah. Tell us about that. Um, so this is kind of funny. So um, if you want, if you look back here, um, I only have ten students right here. Um, so I actually like in like last last spring, I like typed up ten different students and then typed up like schedules like of classes and when classes would be held. And it was kind of random, but also like I would put them like what course that would kind of make sense like with each other. So like for example, Hume with like a lower level math class compared to like um, like. Liter AP Lit with like harder math classes, um, so it kind of makes sense. Um, but this is all data that I made up. Mm -hmm. um, I 
I, I mean, <laughs> I also, like, I, it was nice to work with, like, fewer students so I could manually check the students and make sure that they were, their schedules actually worked out. Because um, sometimes I would, like, when I was writing this, I would have situations where I would write the code and they would have schedules, but they weren't working schedules for some reason. Um, so I started with, like, fewer students, um, but my code is general, can be generalized for more students, too. Um, so I was conscious of that when I was writing the code, um, so I can have a larger input, um, not w and my code would still work for that. How many classes did you have in your model? Um, there, I, I, know, I don't know exactly how many classes, but there were a lot of classes. I think I set like a limit of, I think I might have set a limit of like when I was originally coding of like two students max per class. I had so few students in mm -hmm. a lot of classes. Um, throughout this long process, because you've been living with this for a while <laughs> and tweaking, like you said, what bigger life lessons have you learned from this? Ooh. Yeah. Um, I was just talking about this, um, but I feel like I, in the process of this, I've kind of learned what tools I have when working with problems. Mm -hmm. um, I think that like there's there's a lot of tools out there, um, and like I before doing this, I had very limited experience with coding. Um, and there's a lot of tools on the internet that I would like use, or like books that I would use um, that I didn't know existed. <laughs> um, so I think I was became more aware of the resources that I had, um, whether it was like from NMH or like if it was Abby, <laughs> or if it was like like literally anything. I had I had a lot of tools that I wasn't really aware of before. Um, so I think that's something that I definitely took away from this with. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>so yeah um, I'm gonna talk about how I use 3d printing to kind of enhance stem cell regeneration and I was hoping this to be more like a conversation rather than a presentation so if you guys have any questions throughout or if I lost you for some reason just raise your hand and if you have any questions just go for it um, so more specifically um, I worked on how stem cell interacted with um, 3d printed shark skin surfaces and I'll explain explain what shark skin is in a moment, but um, it's basically basically by tweaking uh, the 3D printer to produce a different surface topography. Um, and I did this project, uh, like Kim said, over summer in um, Stony Brook University, and continue with Jolene um, to analyze my data and work through a lot of the nuances. Um, so I guess the most essential question in my uh, project is what are stem cells? Um, stem cells are a primitive type of cell that can differentiate into specific kind of cells. Primitive meaning that um, it's basically, it's kind of like a cell, but it only consists of nucleus and um, other uh, more essential organelles in a cell. And it can differentiate into specific cells like uh, muscle cell, nerve cells. And um, this differentiation happens um, because of its surrounding and environment influences. Um, so, for instance, if it's going to differentiate into a muscle cell, then a muscle cell would, might have um, stronger actin, which is the structure that connects the cell and builds, um, helps it contract. Um, and or if it, if it were gonna turn into a nerve cell, it might be, um, it might change its cell structure to be longer and um, able to conduct uh, signals better. 
And um, there's a lot of research going on um, about stem cells because, um, because of its ability to differentiate into different types of cells. You could also use, um, well, scientists are hoping that you can use stem cells to make different kinds of tissue and then maybe even um, uh, make them into organ. Yeah. Are stem cells the cells inside the umbilical cord? Um, I think when when you yeah I think uh, when when you're when when you start out as a fetus um, there's uh, this thing called embryonic stem cells which um, is literally I, it's it's the origin of all stem cells and it differentiates into different types of stem cells and then these sp more specific stem cells um, turn into um, tissue structure so yeah. Um, uh, the, I think the embryonic stem cell uh, exists when you are a fetus and then turns into different reason, kinds of cells. The reason I say is they offered my daughter, who just had a baby, mm -hmm. for the price of $3,000 a year, they would oh, keep a frozen uh, umbilical cord. Wow. wow. <laughs> yeah, there, that, there is a lot of research on this, so I wouldn't be surprised if it's such a high price. Is that um, so you fight cancer, eventually, potentially? or? Um, some some stem cells are used in cancer therapy because um, it's a really primitive state. So, um, and cancer is kind of like a degradation of stem cells. Um, and people use stem cells to investigate how mutations happen because there's such a variety of stem cells, um, and you can really tap in to see oh what's wrong in each organelle. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of cancer treatment on stem cells too. So yeah. Um, other, other than organ repair, where um, people try to use stem cells to make their own organ, and so more personalized medicine, where you can use your own stem cells to make an own organ. How good is that? Um, and also, we, people use that for cancer treatment as well. And for the sake of uh, my project, I use dental pulp stem cells. Um, dental pulp stem cells are more, um, oh, and this is, this is an image of how stem cells kind of differentiate. But, um, oops, sorry. So dental pulp stem cell is a more specialized stem cell. It's called multipotent, which means that um, it can only differentiate into three types of um, tissue, odontogenic, which is tooth, osteogenic, which is bone, and neurogenic, um, which is neurons. And yeah, so uh, this, is how, this is where I explained. So this is your embryonic stem cell, which gives off all these kind of stem cells. And then these stem cells gives off another more specific type of multipotent stem cells, and then it comes um, your tissue. And so, um, obviously we want to use stem cells to make organs, but how do we control them? And this, this, this is a big question that um, scientists have, have been struggling. Um, stem cells are usually controlled by its chemical interaction with the environment, which means that you can insert some types of chemical or uh, soluble cytokines to affect the cell um, on its outer and uh, affect its pathway and kind of signal the cell what to grow in. Or mechanical, um, in this case, um, like shear stress, stiffness, um, mechanical strain, these forces um, on the outer of the stem cell that kind of tell them um, what to grow into and what to react with this pressure. And in specific, topography is um, the surface roughness of um, the environment um, that the stem cells are surrounding and is what I'm gonna focus on in my project. Um, and then a little background. So how does that relate to 3D printing? Um, so like I said, topography is really important to um, um, this uh, stem cell growth. And because you can use 3D printing to make different models of any shape that you want. So it's really convenient for um, tissue regenerative scientists to like say, if you want to grow a tooth, make print, 3D print out a tooth, a structure of a tooth, and then inject your stem cells in it, and just place it in your tooth, and so the stem cells could grow into the shape of your tooth. Um, and for this uh, project, I use the Ultimaker Extended 2 Plus printer, which is the one we have in the library, so that's pretty cool. Um, looks like that. Um, and how this works is it's a fused deposition modeling 3D printing, which means that it prints layers and layers of um, kind of small strands of the material uh, and to, to make it into uh, the structure. 
Um, and then, like I said, um, the importance of uh, 3D printing to stem cell is to provide a scaffold, to provide a platform that could um, help stem cells grow into whatever shape it wants. But more than that, um, it could minimize CM, which is the outer sort of um, gives off a lot of signal to tell the cells what to do. And if the scaffolds could provide attachment and better proliferation, which means growth of the cell for um, these stem cells. And then lastly, um, in this uh, project, I use biodegradable materials. Biodegradable meaning that um, it can be naturally dissolved by the human body without any harm. So say if you, if you have like um, a metal tooth, and you would need the metal tooth for, uh, to live in your body forever. But if you have a biodegradable material, and in this case, I used um, polylactic acid, which is PLA. It's, um, pretty commercialized uh, plastic. It's made from corn, so it's totally um, uh, unharmful, and um, you could place it in your body, and it would degrade and dissolve in a matter of weeks and months. So it wouldn't harm your body, and it would allow the stem cells to grow to the shape you want. And so, like I said, I focus on the topography of these scaffolds, and these, the, um, for the sake of research, I print I printed um, these identical scaffolds here. It's kind of like a small disc, disc shape, and then I'll place stem cells on it. And um, like I said, um, I focus on its topography, so now we're gonna get into its surface roughness and how it's important for, um, t for the stem cells to grow. And cells are really small. Uh, and obviously to, to really um, change the cell in any way, we would have to um, attack it or to interact it on like a nanoscale. And a nanoscale, kind of to, to uh, give you a sense of a nano is 10 to the negative ninth meter, and it's even, uh, it's around the size of an x-ray wavelength, um, a little bit smaller than a virus. So it's, it's really, really small, and there's no way we could use a regular microscopy to um, observe it by eye. So what we do to look at the topography, which is the surface roughness of these 3D printed scaffolds, is we use a um, machine called um, the Atomic Force Microscopy. Um, and how it works is, it basically it's a machine with a small tip at the end, and you drag it along the surface, and as it hits a bump, it would move up and down, because it's, it's close to the surface, so it's like moving up and down and then you shine like a laser light on it, and as it bounces, um, the laser bounces elsewhere too, and so that gives like kind of a rough um, image of what the surface looks like at a nanoscale, which is pretty cool. Um, and so when we use this machine for the 3D printed scaffolds, we see that um, there's these small bumps that happen on the um, surface of the scaffold. And when we zoom out, it kind of looks like this, a piece of scaffold with a lot of like small bumps in there. <coughs> kind of looks like um, a shark skin with its small denticles uh, on, a, on like a nanoscale. So we char characterize this uh, surface roughness as shark skin, hence the shark skin scaffold. Um, and um, kind of just talking about how shark skin occurs, um, it really arises from the attraction between the polymer, which is what you inject into the 3D printing machine, and its nozzle metal. Um, because a polymer kind of behaves like strands of uh, spaghetti, for instance. So imagine if you have a ball of spaghetti, and it's coiled up. And when you try to pull it out, if you pull it really fast, it snaps really easily, right? Because the force inside the spaghetti is holding the um, spaghetti, each strand of spaghetti in. So kind of like that, um, the force on the 3D printing nozzle, which is the tip of the 3D printer, holds the um, polymers in. And when you uh, use a force to push the, um, the filament, with, which is the polymer, out, it breaks and it slips and sticks onto the surface. So provide kind of like 
giving off these small breaks onto the surface, which gives off um, this surface roughness and hence the shark skin scaffold. And so what happens when you extrude these uh, polymer on a higher speed? Um, it's kind of back to the spaghetti uh, analogy. When you slowly pull the strand of spaghetti out, uh, you might be able to pull the whole ball out into its original long form of spaghetti. But if you pull it at, at a really fast speed, it's really easy that the spaghetti might break. And that's the same thing for um, extruding um, these polymers out of the 3D printer. So I kind of hypothesized that when you increase the extrusion speed, that would change the topography of the scaffold as well. And um, I used four groups of speed, 50, 75, 100, and 150, to uh, model different kinds of roughness and see how it affects. And so again, using uh, the machine that tells you the nano roughness of the scaffold, we see that um, RMS, which is the average roughness of each scaffold, increases by a lot as um, the speed goes up. And that's really interesting because then we can place stem cells on it and see how these nanotopography really affect stem cell growth. And so by logic, stem cell differentiation is affected by this topography. And these uh, different extrusion speed provide different topography. So I hypothesized that um, stem cells on different topography would differentiate into different kinds of cell, or at least different, cell, different cells with distinctive uh, features. Uh, and this is, I, I'm just gonna blow through this. <laughs> this. This is kind of not that important, but basically we print out the small disk of uh, scaffolds and then we play the, stem, the cells on it and it's divided into four groups with different speed. Um, yeah, and we cultured it in the medium that's for dental pulse stem cell growth. So normally without any alteration, this would grow into um, tooth cells. Um, and for the analysis part, a, a good uh, measure of hand to, uh, to analyze cells is first, the first stage is to characterize how well it grows. So that's by seeing its cell attachment to the surface, how much it attaches to the scaffold and the pro proliferation, which is the growth of the cell. And then the second stage, we get into how well it differentiates into different types of cells. So for cell counting, we use a hemocytometer and Olimar blue stain. What that is, is basically um, you, you uh, kind of inject the cells with the medium into like this small well of um, a bunch of lines and um, uh, different cubes. And each, each kind of small spacing is really small. It's um, a millimeter big. So um, after we inject that into, af after we inject the cells into that, we use a um, microscope to see how many um, cells are in each block. So by that, and then we count um, how many cells are in a block, and then we times whatever the factor is, and to see how many cells are in on each scaffold. And so interesting, the, um, the one, uh, the scaffolds with higher speed have a lower cell number um, as we go through day one or day seven. Um, and the doubling time just shows, um, if the higher the doubling time, it means that the, the cell grows slower. And by this graph, you can see that the 150 millimeter speed um, scaffolds are a big difference between um, the other groups in terms of how well it's growing. And then on day seven, we look at cell morphology, which is basically just looking at a cell un under um, a microscopy. And to help us identify each cell uh, more clear, we um, stain the components of the cell with um, different colors. So green is for actin, which is the threads in the cell that kind of support the cells. And then blue is the nuclear, which is the center or the most important part of the cell. And so the left, the left graph shows um, a 50 millimeter speed extrusion and the right one shows a 150 millimeter speed extrusion. So there's a big difference between these two graphs. You can see that the one on the right is, I guess, I don't, I don't know if it's clear, it's kind of small here, but um, 
you can see that the one on the right is a bit longer and smoother than one on the left. But that's not really quantitative, and as scientists, we have to quantify everything. Um, I, we hope, at least. Mm -hmm. um, so we look at um, the nuclear aspect ratio. And the nuclear aspect ratio just means that we take each um, nuclear, which is the blue part, and then we measure its length and its width, and compare its length and width to see um, what the ratio of length to width is. So if it gives a high nuclear aspect ratio, that means um, the cell is really stretched out and the cell nuclei is really long. So um, we can see from the graph that, um, uh, again, with higher extrusion speed, the cells are longer, and the, so the nuclei are, long, are longer too. And it kind of makes sense because there's a lot of roughness on the one with the higher extrusion speed, so the cells would have to kind of like try and find a way out the different bumps. So it's going to be longer and more stretched out. And that kind of explains uh, on the previous slide why it's less grown on the scaffold. <coughs> and then on to, um, to, to look at the cell differentiation, um, we can see, we could see that through a uh, biomineral deposit. Um, a big factor of um, cell differentiating is that with different cells, it would kind of deposit different minerals and materials onto the scaffold. And so we use this machine called scanning electron microscopy, which kind of just shows how much um, each material um, is on the scaffold. I'm not going to get into detail, but um, the results kind of show that it shows how much of each element is on the scaffold. So interestingly, the one on the left is 50 again, and the one on the right is 150. And with the one with the higher extrusion speed, um, there's more calcium and phosphorus on the scaffold, which means um, it differentiates into um, bone cells more because of the calcium and phosphorus. So um, that's a good marker for um, how well the cells differentiate into different cells. Um, and uh, another way to see how well it differentiates is by gene expression. And gene expression is important because your gene makes up the whole cell, and which makes up the protein and how well the cell is going to perform and what kind of cell it's going to be. And we use the RT-PCR, which is a machine that shows what gene uh, it is in each cell. Um, and we look at two types of um, uh, mRNA or primers, which which is just the the gene part of the cell, and one shows the OC and one shows uh, bone expression, um, and the right one DSPP shows uh, tooth expression. And we can see from the the, the two graphs that um, both groups, uh, when the extrusion speed increases, the uh, expression or the upregulation of these um, gene are more um, uh, it's kind of, um, they, they, they're increasing these cells as well. So we kind of conclude that um, the higher the extrusion speed is, more bone and tooth expression appears on um, these cells. In kind of a summary, so we see that with higher extru extrusion speed, um, it grows slower, uh, cells are elongated, but there's more expression and uh, more cells are um, turning it into bone tooth cells, which is um, really interesting because um, as like a takeaway and conclusion, we could kind of manipulate the scaffolds to increase how much um, these cells are growing. Um, but it also serves to caution that 3D printing, um, there's a lot of nuances in there and um, we, um, when using stem cells with 3D printers and 3D printed scaffolds, we have to make sure that the speed is constant or else there's going to, um, we would yield different results. Um, but in the future, uh, we might be able to control these um, 3D printing topography at uh, a nano scale and hopefully enhance uh, stem cell growth and grow into um, organs and tissues. <laughs> yeah, and I just want to acknowledge um, Sonnenberg University and my professor and also Jolene for helping me through the, the analysis and writing of my paper. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. So 
I thought that the presentation was going to be change the roughness and see what happens, but your analysis was change extrusion speed and see what happens. Yeah, I, I guess I didn't explain it that well. Um, the ex when you increase the extrusion speed, that also changes um, the roughness. Um, yeah, so when you increase the extrusion speed here, so um, these stand for the extrusion speed. So as you go higher, the roughness of each scaffold increases too. So with higher extrusion speeds means um, rougher surface. So kind of um, like a summary, a rougher surface would yield um, uh, more enhanced cells in tooth and bone growth. Yeah. So with the um, difference between the <coughs> slower growth and the faster growth, does does that also result in a different quality of mm -hmm. uh, cell overall in the end? Does the faster growing cell not produce as good of a result as the slower growing cell? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, one of our concern was that, oh, it's growing really slow, so it might turn out that well. But um, there's a point where each cell on the scaffold reach confluency, and confluency just means that it covers up the whole um, scaffold. And all groups at a certain point reach confluency, which means they all grow to a certain point where they're covered up the whole scaffold and they won't grow anymore. So that means that they all turn out to grow fine. It's just the groups with higher extrusion speed um, grow slower. But at, in the end, they really enhance um, these different types of cell growth. Great, thank you. Oh, okay, I won't oh, go for it. So um, after having worked through all this, what percentage of this kind of work is requiring a bright scientist's mind, and what part of it requires just a brute force assembly line cranking things out? I would say 95% <laughs> is the latter. <laughs> There's a lot of repeating the same thing, injecting cells, um, washing the scaffolds, and then putting under test, but um, it's definitely, it's, it's, it's definitely um, kind of exciting to see what the results are. It's just there's definitely a lot of tedious work in between, and you know, they said it takes hard work to actually get results, so yeah. I would, I would respectfully disagree with you. <laughs> I think it takes a lot more ingenuity. I think you're not giving yourself and your, and your coworkers, not, not me, I have nothing to do with it, um, enough credit. Because there's so much to designing those mm -hmm. experiments and then thinking how to analyze them and then thinking what does this analysis mean because there's mm -hmm. so many factors that are important. Yeah, there's a lot of times where although we're doing the same thing, we're thinking, oh, if this happens then what we should what we should do and a lot of times we hit a lot of failures, so what we do is we have to tweak the experiment in a way to kind of make the result um, work, I guess. Um, and that does uh, involve a lot of ingenuity, yeah. Well, thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for coming. There's refreshments here. Please feel free to hang out for a little bit. <laughs>